Thank you very much. The mic is working. I always have this fear that I'm going to show up and the hall is going to be empty, so <laughs> thank you for me not having that fear realized this afternoon. Um, just a few specific thanks. One, to the uh, Vandervelde family, it's a great honor for me um, to be asked to deliver this lecture today, and I'm really looking forward to it. And um, to President Leibowitz and, the Mil and Mil Middlebury College, uh, which has been a friend to my family for some time. Um, to Al Allison Byerly for that um, wonderful introduction. The introduction is getting longer and longer, which means I'm getting older and older. Um, to uh, Shirley and Alfredo Ramirez, who are very instrumental in bringing me here. Um, they are good friends of mine and even better friends of my wife, Debbie Beal, who is here to give me moral support in case this is a particularly difficult audience. <laughs> Um, I know the presidential election is on the minds of a lot of you. It's not going to be the focus of my talk today. I'll be referring to it, but I am going to take questions at the end of the lecture, and I'll be happy to talk about the uh, election, the campaign, and anything else anyone, anyone might want to ask. I love those... Um, stupid criminal stories you find on the web. I get on the web and I'm supposed to be writing a column and I gotta Google something, you know, and then, yeah, stupid criminal stories. <laughs> Bob, you need to write a column. <laughs> uh, but one of my favorites is about this guy in South Carolina who became impatient as he was coming to the end of a four-month prison term. And with just three hours left to go before he was to be released, he thought it might be a good idea, seeing an opportunity to escape. <laughs> to seize that opportunity. Um, so he bolted from a recreation session and he fled. That is a quintessential example of poor decision making. The escapee was soon captured and sent back to jail for another six months, which was two months longer than his original sentence. Then there was the ex-convict who robbed a bank and was surprised when the police showed up at his home a short while later to arrest him. How'd you know it was me, he asked. I used the juice. The police did not know what he was talking about. It turned out that he had rubbed lemon juice on his face because someone had told him that that would make it impossible for the security cameras to record his image. <laughs> he went into the bank thinking of himself as the invisible man. Uh, one more. The guy stole a car. Uh, when the victim described it to the police, she told them it had a phone in it. So a cop called the number, thief answered the phone. Cop said, I saw your ad in the newspaper and I am interested in buying your car. <laughs> sure enough, they made an appointment. <laughs> and the thief showed up with the car and was arrested. These are amusing examples of utter incompetence, but they're funny because the consequences are not too horrendous. Things seem a lot less funny when we watch a great country like the United States fall into what I think right now is a state of crisis, largely because of the incompetence of our leadership. This is hardly a nation that is flourishing. The great promise of the United States, which seemed to be reaching fruition in the post-World War II period has run aground. We all remember the awful images coming out of New Orleans in the summer of 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. I can't think of that tragedy without thinking how much of that suffering and loss of life
was unnecessary. New Orleans was a city sacrificed on the altar of incompetence. Leaders at the local, state, and national level had long understood that a catastrophic flood was likely to strike the bowl-shaped city. It sat below sea level, shoved up against the mighty Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. But as Newsweek noted, though more than 100,000 residents had no way to get out of the city on their own, New Orleans had no real evacuation plan. Katrina wasn't even the monster storm that had been anticipated. When it hit the city, it was a Category 3 hurricane, not the feared Category 4 or 5. But the city was so poorly protected and ill-prepared that it was all but destroyed. Douglas Brinkley, the historian who lives in New, in New Orleans and wrote a remarkable book on the flood called The Deluge, I really recommend that book, offered this terrible indictment. This is a quote. What people don't yet fully comprehend, he said, was that the overall disaster, the sinking of New Orleans, was a man-made debacle resulting from poorly designed levees and flood walls. I remember standing in the middle of the Lower Ninth Ward more than a year after the storm and having the feeling that I'd stepped into the aftermath of some kind of nuclear hell. That's how extensive the devastation was. I had personally never seen anything like it, like it. not when I was overseas in Korea in, in the Army, not when I was in Haiti covering uprisings and seeing um, uh, uh, terrible incidents, including slaughters, murders, that sort of thing. I'd never seen anything like what had happened in, the, in uh, New Orleans. And what I kept thinking as I stood in the fading light of a gloomy December afternoon, and as I looked at the endless city blocks, just block after block after block, devoid of people and denuded of housing, as I looked at this apocalyptic American disaster, I just kept thinking, this never had to happen. All of this could have been prevented. What gets missed in the 24-hour news cycles and the endless tedium of politicians bickering and singing their own praises is the human toll that results from the bad decisions made by people in high public office. The politicians won't even acknowledge that they've made any bad decisions. Just like President Bush told his FEMA director, Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job, John McCain <laughs> John McCain and the Republicans are out there on the campaign trail telling the American people that we're winning the war in Iraq. If the media could bring itself to take its cameras off of Britney Spears or Lindsay Lohan for a moment, and I might get in a little trouble here, I've got to be careful. <laughs> I think those are the correct names, but I'm getting a little old. And in my day, the pop stars were Diana Ross and Elvis and Ray Charles, so you'll forgive me if I goof up on the names. But I was told that I could say Britney Spears and Lindsay Lohan and I'd be safe. <laughs> I had an assistant, this is an aside, I had an assistant a few years ago. She was in her 20s. And she had a couple of her friends in the outer office at the Times. And, and I don't know why Bobby Darren was on my mind, but I asked if they, I mentioned Bobby Darren. I got all these blank stares. <laughs> and I said, haven't you ever heard of Bobby Darren? <laughs> None of them had heard of Bobby. <laughs> I went back in my office and tried to keep from weeping. But if the media would concentrate a little less on Brittany and company and focus instead, for example, on the GI struggling to overcome paralysis or the amputation of limbs or blindness or depression at the Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, or if we could get a close-up look at the 4,000 fa 4, families of the Americans who have lost their lives in Iraq, or the scores of thousands of Iraqis who have been slaughtered in this war that we started for no good reason. And if we were willing to look honestly at the real economic costs of the war, two trillion dollars and counting, to be paid by your children and grandchildren because we're sure not paying for it. If we could somehow look at that and manage to understand it, we might not be so quick to claim victory and we might think instead about cutting our losses and bringing the boys and girls home from Iraq. Now, don't get me wrong, politicians can be entertaining. I get as much of a kick as the next, per next person out of their frequently dopey behavior. 
I remember Dan Quayle. Some of you remember Dan Quayle, right? <laughs> For those who don't, he was the Vice President of the United States. It was hard to believe then and even harder to believe now. <laughs> but I remember that Dan Quayle made a trip to the South Pacific in 1989, and one of his stops was in American Samoa, where he told the natives, much to the embarrassment of his aides, this is a quote, Vice President of the United States, you all look like happy campers to me. <laughs> happy campers you are. Happy campers, you have been. And as far as I'm concerned, happy campers, you will always be. Now, can you imagine the natives looking at this guy in a <laughs> suit, coming to visit them, talking like that? Quail, after that, Quail went on to Pongo Pongo, only he called it Pogo Pogo. <laughs> it seemed at the time that the first President Bush may not have wanted to be outdone in the foolishness department by his vice president. He once told us, unfortunately, now this is the President of the United States, not the Vice President. This is a quote. It has been said by some cynic, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. But I didn't need that, the former President said, because I have Barbara Bush. <laughs> Very unfortunate comparison. Anyway, we can get a good laugh from the foolishness sometimes. But we've got some truly serious issues, some very tough issues to deal with in this country right now. And they're not being honestly addressed by the White House, by the media, or even by the presidential candidates of either party. Now let's take a step back in time for a moment to get another look at what I mean by the very personal toll that these foul-ups, bad decision-making, incompetence, at the highest levels of government can take on people at the lowest levels, very ordinary Americans, which is what I certainly was back in 1965 when, with Vietnam raging, I was drafted into Lyndon Johnson's army. This is a piece, I did not um, go to Vietnam, lucky for me. I was sent to, Cor to Korea just by the luck of the draw, but a lot of my friends went to Vietnam and some did not come home. This is a piece I wrote for the New York Times on the 25th anniversary of the end of the war in Vietnam. Now the 30th anniversary has come and gone, but anyway. The column carried the headline, A Fool's Errand. Paul Conover and I met Michael Farmer during basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey in the mid-1960s. Conover and I were friends from Montclair. Farmer was a kid from Atlantic City, a 17-year-old who mumbled so badly you could never be sure what he was saying. He was big and good looking, but the first impression was that he wasn't too swift. One night, Farmer came over to the barracks, uninvited, while Conover and I, who were a couple of years older and light years cooler, you have to trust me that we were cooler, <laughs> were sitting on the floor spit shining our combat boots. Now, some of you may wonder what's so cool about spit shining combat boots. Don't ask. I don't have time to go into that. Very tentatively and very politely, Farmer asked if he could join us. I told him to get lost. Farmer must not have understood because he promptly sat down, took off his boots, and over the next few minutes proved to my satisfaction that he was as dumb as he sounded. First he told us he had joined the army. Conover grinned and rolled his eyes. Then Farmer said he was in love with a girl in Atlantic City and planned to marry her. I shook my head. This was not a person worth spending time with. As a draftee, all I wanted was for my hair to grow back and to be reunited with that gleaming symbol of freedom and the good life, my Thunderbird. <laughs> but Conover liked Farmer and told him to come back the next night. He mumbles, I said, but Conover said, ah, he's all right. So Farmer came back night after night to smoke cigarettes, listen to Motown music, mumble about his girlfriend, and polished boots. To my chagrin, I started to like him, though I still needed a translator to understand him. For the longest time, I thought his girlfriend's name was Merlin. It was Marilyn. <laughs> Farmer and Conover became very close. Eventually, both of them were sent to Vietnam. 
I got lucky and was sent to Korea, which was no walk in the park, but it wasn't Vietnam. The impact of the war on Conover and Farmer was strange. When Farmer came back, he seemed more sure of himself, more open and fun-loving, less insecure. He and Marilyn were married. Conover, the most happy-go-lucky guy I had ever known, was a wreck. He was nervous, jumpy. Some nights he would drink like a fiend. The cheerful optimism that had once defined his personality was gone. He wouldn't really talk about Vietnam. All I ever heard him say was, I didn't know I could get so scared. Then the unthinkable happened. A farmer who had enlisted for four years and was still in the service got orders to go back to Vietnam. We told him not to go. Call your congressman, we said. Fight this thing. But Farmer didn't know how. It's not hard to guess what happened. Farmer's second tour lasted only a few months. I was in the back of my father's upholstery shop one afternoon when Conover walked in. Farmer didn't make it, he said, and then he started crying. A year passed. I got a job at the newspaper. Conover got married. Other buddies got killed in the war, which began to look like it would go on forever. My sister's boyfriend got shot. I didn't realize it, but Conover's struggle was winding down. He wouldn't make it either. I never got the story straight. All I know is that he got his hands on a gun, and one night he waited in a car outside his house for his wife to come home. When she showed up, he shot her dead, and then he killed himself. Sunday was the 25th anniversary of the end of the war, which I cannot think about without thinking of Farmer and Conover. Neither had a clue about the politics or the history or the egos that sucked them up like dust from a carpet and consigned them to their pointless fates. Vietnam was a fool's errand, and the young and the ignorant went to their doom by the tens of thousands. When David Brinkley, appalled by the carnage, asked Lyndon Johnson why he didn't just pull out of Vietnam, thus saving many lives, Johnson replied, I am not going to be the first American president to lose a war. A couple of years ago, I visited the Vietnam Memorial in Washington. I found Farmer's name and then, not thinking, looked for Conover's. Of course, it wasn't there. But his short life and that of his wife, whose name I don't know, were wasted by Vietnam just as surely as the lives of those 58,000 other Americans listed on that bitter wall. If we've learned any lessons from the Vietnam experience, I don't know what they are. Because here we are bogged down in another insane, unwinnable war, a war that has already lasted longer than our involvement in World War II. And we're treating the troops who are fighting the war in Iraq worse than those who fought in Vietnam. My friend, Michael Farmer, was killed because he was forced to serve two tours in the combat zone. In Iraq, because we don't have a draft, which would mean an endless supply of cannon fodder, we're sending the soldiers and Marines into combat for three, four, and even more tours. That's playing Russian roulette with their lives, and it's unconscionable. Just last week, there was a story in the New York Times that said army leaders are alarmed about the mental health of soldiers who are being sent back to the front again and again in Iraq. These troops are exhibiting signs of anxiety, depression, and acute stress, they said. Imagine that. People who are spending their lives, years and years of their young lives, in an environment in which other people are shooting at them, trying to blow them up, where their buddies are being maimed and killed right before their eyes, are actually showing signs of stress. That's really surprising. Sometimes I get the feeling that our leaders have lost it completely, that they are no longer in touch with the real world. One of my reasons for talking so much about the war in Iraq is that it stands like a boulder in the road, blocking progress on so many other issues that are crucial to our viability as a society. There's nothing secret about these issues. We're going through economic hard times. Actually, there was, my wife read a story to me in the car on the way up here today. There's a story in the New York Times today that said in the recent recovery under George W. Bush, it was the first time in recorded history 
that the middle class had not expanded during the course of the recovery. That is a very, very grim sign. In any event, good jobs at good pay are increasingly hard to find. For many workers, paid vacations are a fantasy, and employer-paid health benefits will soon be a relic of a distant industrial past. The subprime mortgage crisis is causing tremendous hardship, not just for the poor and working classes, but for many middle-class Americans as well. We're hostages to our reliance on increasingly expensive foreign oil. The public schools in many places, especially the large cities and rural areas, are a mess. The fortunate youngsters who succeed in getting through four years of college, in some cases at really great schools like Middlebury, like this one, are often saddled with debt that will take them the better part of a lifetime to pay off. And, as if all that wasn't bad enough, global warming, threatening to fry all of us to a crisp. Now, I love Al Gore, but I get frightened every time I see him on television now. It's like he's carrying this sign, you know, the end is near. It's like, it's like those old Al. <laughs> You're scaring me, man. It wasn't always like this. Archibald McLeish and Arthur Miller like to say that the essence of America was its promise. This was the place where the next generation was always going to be smarter, better educated, healthier, and more prosperous, just flat out better off than its parents' and grandparents' generation. There was general agreement that that was how it should be. There was even a name for it, the American dream. I consider myself the poster child for the American dream. I was born right at the end of World War II, the first of the baby boomers. For me and my peers, a good education was cheap and readily available. Good jobs were plentiful, even for those who didn't have a college degree. I walked into a newspaper office in 1970 with no journalism background at all and was hired on the spot as a reporter. Fate seemed to have smiled on the United States in that post-war period, and we made the most of it. We dreamed big, individually and as a society. Americans believed that great things were possible, and they were. This started right after the war, and we had a hell of a run for about three decades. By leading the effort to create the United Nations, for example, the U.S. led the way in the quest for world peace. Peace, not war. We developed the Marshall Plan to rebuild Western Europe. The GI Bill made it possible for many veterans to purchase that all-important first family home and get a college degree. In many cases, those GIs were the first members of their families ever to go to college. All across America, we built schools and housing and highways, and we established a standard of living that was the envy of the world. People fought hard for the things they believed in. Astonishing advances were made during that period in civil rights, in women's rights, in gay rights, and civil liberties. The environmental movement was born. We came to understand that workers and consumers had rights, and even the criminally accused. Much of the greatness of the United States, including so much that we now take for granted, was forged in those amazingly productive and extremely exciting years. Where are we now? As I mentioned, we're once again stuck in a war that can't be won and never should have been launched. That long run of ever-increasing prosperity, the cornerstone of the American dream, fizzled out, believe it or not, more than 30 years ago. Men who are now in their 30s, the prime age for raising families, earn less money than members of their father's generation did at the same age. The median income for men in their 30s in 1974, using today's inflation-adjusted dollars, was about $40,000. Those annual earnings have dropped to approximately $35,000. That's ominous. If you adjust for inflation, from 1980 to 2005, the average income for the vast majority of Americans actually declined. The standard of living for the average family has improved, not because personal incomes have grown, but because women went into the workforce in droves. The, <coughs> excuse me.
the peak income year for most Americans, the bottom 90%, which means all but the rich, was way back in 1973. That was before most of the students at Middlebury were even born. Back then, the average inflation-adjusted income per taxpayer was $33,000. That's nearly $4,000 higher than the average today. The peak was 1973. We're going backwards. My friend and colleague at the New York Times, David K. Johnston, an absolute whiz at economics, wrote the following in his latest book, which is called Free Lunch. Quote, the pattern here is clear. The rich are getting fabulously richer. The vast majority are somewhat worse off. And the bottom half, for all practical purposes, the poor, are being savaged by our current, our current economic policies. End quote. That is not an overstatement. It's the plain truth. We get a very skewed picture of how well Americans are doing from the media and from the corporate and political elite. The harsh reality is that 37 million Americans live in poverty, a large percentage of them children. Another 57 million live just one notch above the poverty line. Those near poor Americans live in households with incomes of $20,000 to $40,000 a year for a family of four. Imagine trying to raise a family of four on twenty-five or $30,000 or $35,000 a year. They work at jobs that are highly unstable and offer few, if any, benefits. Nearly half of all children in the United States of America are growing up in households that are poor or near poor. In a country with as much wealth as the United States has, that's a national disgrace. There is a huge disconnect between the sense of America you will get from watching television and listening to the politicians and the reality you will find if you travel around this country. As I said, a key aspect of the American dream was the belief that each succeeding generation would be better off than the last. But that's no longer such a widely held belief. A national poll conducted for the Change to Win Labor Federation showed that only a tiny 16% of working Americans believed that their children's generation would be better off than their own. A poll cited by my paper, surveying people across class lines, showed that only a third of the respondents expected their children to be better off than they are. Take your pick. Both polls show the American dream on life support. Without that dream, there is not much that's truly special about America. The glory of this country is in the dream. It's the power of that dream that draws so many immigrants to the United States. When I was a young man, I could make a cold call to the Star Ledger in Newark, in New Jersey, have the managing editor answer the phone himself, and get hired almost immediately without a second's worth of experience. I could look through the classified ads in the New York Times, hop on a subway train, and rent an affordable apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, right across the street from one of the main entrances to Central Park. College was not only affordable, but there was a check that would come in the mail periodically from the GI Bill. My father was an upholsterer and my mother was a seamstress, <clears throat> but they dreamed that their son in the back of the shop, the skinny kid with the big thick glasses, could make something of himself if he used his head and worked hard. My father, smart guy, could not have held any of the jobs that I've held in my career. He couldn't have been a reporter at the Star Ledger, or city editor of the Daily News, or a national television correspondent for NBC News, or an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. But he could dream that things could be better for his son. And this country was the place where that quantum leap could be made in just one generation. My life is a quintessential example of what it's like to live the American dream and the privileges that so many of us enjoy today because of the extraordinary opportunities that were open to us carry with them the obligation to nurture that dream. We don't have the right to let the dream die. As we all know, this is an election year, one of the most significant of my lifetime. 
The important question for us as we move through this election season and beyond to the post-Bush era is what kind of country do we really want? We should be serious about that. Do we want a country that spends a couple of trillion dollars on a god-awful war for oil in the sands of Iraq, but that cannot find the money it needs to rebuild its own aging, decrepit infrastructure? Remember what David Brinkley said about New Orleans. The sinking of New Orleans was a man-made debacle, resulting from the poorly designed levees and flood walls. Man-made. We could have kept those people alive, but we didn't. Another man-made disaster was the collapse last August of the Interstate 35W Bridge over the Mississippi River in Minneapolis, a bridge that plunged 60 feet into the water at the height of rush hour, killing 13 people. It's a miracle more people weren't killed. Refusing to repair and properly maintain the nation's infrastructure is like ignoring the rotting roof of your home until it collapses on your family and kills somebody. It makes no sense. Is that the kind of country we want? The American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that we would have to spend more than a trillion and a half dollars over a five-year period to bring the U.S. infrastructure, its roads, bridges, schools, levees, water treatment facilities, electrical grid, and so forth, just into reasonably decent shape. Are we doing that? No. Money that could be used to rebuild our infrastructure is being squandered, among other places, in Iraq. There are other important issues. Do we want a country where so many kids in the inner city grow up poor, never work at a regular job, and never think in terms of careers, marriage, honeymoons, home ownership, and the joy of raising a thriving family? Do we want a country in which six million young people aged 16 to 24 have dropped out of high school? And that's not counting those who are still in school but won't go on to graduate. And this is occurring at a time when a four-year college degree has become a virtual prerequisite to a middle-class quality of life. Is that the kind of country that we want? Do we want a country where in this subprime mortgage fiasco Families are being put out on the street day after day after day. More than two million households are expected to ultimately face foreclosure. Each of those households is a family of real people, decent people, just like us, who are being put out of their homes. The mortgage swindlers, and in many cases it was outright fraud, ignored by the government agencies that should have been regulating them, descended like vultures, in many cases, on the poor and the ignorant, offering loans not on the basis of whether the homeowners could afford them, but simply on whether they could breathe. If your heart's still beating, said one broker, you qualify for a mortgage. That's how an old woman in Chicago, a woman named Rosa Daly, an old woman who was sick and nearly blind, ended up destitute. I visited her last fall in Chicago. <clears throat> she was behind in her mortgage payments and foreclosure pr proceedings were already underway. There was no heat in her house and barely any food. She was shivering as she talked to me and I couldn't tell if she was shivering because she was afraid of what was going to happen to her or because she was cold. What are you going to do for Thanksgiving? I asked her. I'll be here, she said. I've got some cornflakes and canned vegetables. That'll be my Thanksgiving. There are literally millions of stories like that across the United States. Health insurance? I wrote about Brittany Hightower, <coughs> excuse me, a high school cheerleader in Texas. She was being treated for cancer when her mom's health insurance maxed out. Her mother nearly lost her mind trying to round up the money to keep the treatments going. It's impossible to say how this affected Brittany's outcome, but it nearly ruined the rest of the family. Her mom told me that Brittany fought like crazy to survive. But like my friend Michael Farmer, she didn't make it. She died last June at age 16. Somewhere right now, there are youngsters Brittany's age who are struggling with devastating illnesses, but whose families don't have health insurance. And some of them are going to die because of that. Is that the kind of country the United States of America should be 
in the year 2008. This stuff should be a big deal in the coverage of the presidential campaigns, but mostly we hear about the polls and who's attacking whom and whether this country is ready for a black man or a white woman to be president. I think it's time we got past that and simply ask, are we ready to put somebody who knows what he or she is doing in the White House? If we're considering what kind of country we want, we should ask, is it the kind of country in which over the course of the 2006-2007 school year, you probably haven't heard about this, 34 public school students in the city of Chicago were murdered. 34 public school kids over the course of one school year. Big story? No, we haven't heard much about it. We don't hear much about crime at all in this country unless it involves a celebrity or unless some good-looking woman disappears and it's thought that something horrible has happened to her, which is a specialty of cable TV. But consider this. Since September 11, 2001, when the nation's attention understandably became focused on terrorism, no one has been killed in a terror attack in the United States. But over that same period, nearly 100,000 Americans have been murdered in non-terror-related crimes. 100,000. That's a bloodbath of gigantic proportions 25 times the number of Americans who have died in Iraq. We don't hear much about it. Americans constitute 5% of the world's population, but we've got an astonishing 25% of the world's prison population. And yet we still have these staggering numbers of homicides and other violent crimes. Maybe we should consider another approach to crime and incarceration, because what we're doing right now is sure not working. Now, after this long litany of woe that I've subjected you to, is there an upside? Imagine if the answer was no. <laughs> Let's see what it says here. <laughs> is there an upside? There is. <laughs> As a society, we've come through much harder times than these. This is not the Great Depression or World War II. This is not the Jim Crow era that black people had to struggle through for so many decades. Opportunities for women are no longer as circumscribed as they were in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So we know we can get through this. And I don't have a sense, as I travel the country covering this election, that the American people are apathetic. Just the opposite. They are hungry for leadership, and I think many would like to contribute themselves. So that's a very hopeful sign. But while this is not as bad a time as the Depression or World War II, I do think it's a worse time than most Americans and many of our leaders realize. At the same time that we are saddled with these major economic problems and a debilitating war, the U.S. is going through a transitional period at least as important as the early post-World War II years, and we're not prepared for it. New worlds in energy, technology, the economy, and global interdependence are either upon us or coming on us fast. Changes come at us far more swiftly now than they did in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And God knows the rest of the world is far more competitive. So what are we to do? those of us who care about the country and are disturbed by the current state of affairs. The first thing we have to do is admit that we have a problem, which I think the general public is coming to acknowledge. A recent New York Times poll found that more than 80% of Americans think the country is decidedly on the wrong track. This is a good sign because, we, because we've been pretending for too long that things will somehow right themselves that maybe the fix that the country is in is not as bad as it seems, and that maybe if we finally elect the right president, that person will put us back on the golden path. That kind of quick fix is not going to happen. Things are likely to get tougher in the short term, not easier. The economy, as we know, has sunk or is sinking into a recession. It's going to take a big effort and real sacrifice from all of us to make things right again. 
I wouldn't for a moment deny the crucial importance of this year's presidential election, but the election of a president, even one who is thoughtful and capable and wise, is just a first step. If we're to move forward as a country, the thoughtful members of the electorate, people like you and me, who care about the society we're creating for ourselves and will be leaving to future generations, are going to have to take steps to intervene in our own fates. Just casting a ballot is not enough. We have to make real demands on our leaders. We can't just sit back and say, oh well, they fouled up again, we're in another war, or that was a bad policy, now two more million families will lose their homes. We have an obligation to do more. <clears throat> and I think that means participating more actively ourselves in the civic affairs of the nation. There are times when the citizenry needs to raise hell, and this is one of those times. Only tremendous pressure from the public, for example, will bring our involvement in the war in Iraq to a close, and that's absolutely essential. <coughs> because just like that war took our attention away from the real problem of terror in Afghanistan and allowed bin Laden to set up shop in Pakistan and have a good laugh at our expense, that same war is taking attention away from the enormous challenges we face right here at home. And of course, the war is consuming staggering amounts of money that we desperately need if we're going to seriously address some of the problems that I've been talking about here. If we're really going to move ahead and resuscitate the American dream, we have to be willing, all of us, to make an enormous collective effort. I mean it. There's a job for everyone here to do. Speak out. Talk seriously to your friends and your colleagues at school and at work. Pick out an area of particular concern to you and offer your services as a volunteer where you think you can make a particular contribution. Join a local civic organization or start one. Don't just vote for candidates you admire. Help them. Work in their campaigns. Run for office yourself. Write letters, articles, or speeches. Write a check. Write a letter to the editor. Write a freelance op-ed submission. Try not to be too good at it. <laughs> there are things you can do, and as corny as it sounds, and it does sound corny, your country needs you. We can't just depend on the politicians to get us through this. As the late, great Texas Congresswoman Barbara Jordan said, government is too important to be a spectator sport. When I asked Al Gore last June if there was any chance he might jump into the race for president, he wasn't able to hide his disgust with the political process. And it wasn't just because of his experience in 2000. He told me, what politics has become requires a level of tolerance for triviality and artifice and nonsense that I find I have in short supply. That close quote. This triviality and artifice and incompetence at the highest reaches of power in a period of profound change is itself a sign of a society in trouble. So we need to step up ourselves whenever and wherever we can. Don't sell this idea short. The so-called ordinary people can do wonders. The blacks who sat in at segregated lunch counters in the South or who refused to ride the buses during the Montgomery boycott in the mid-1950s changed the face of this nation. The millions of women who stood up boldly for their rights and put up with grotesque harassment decades ago were absolutely crucial in bringing us to this moment in 2008 when a woman has become one of the two finalists for the Democratic presidential nomination. So when I say the country needs you, I mean it. We can no longer afford to waste the energy and talent of people who can make a real contribution. The world of politics has not given us the leadership we need, so we have to broaden our search. To the business world, yes, but also to artists and writers and intellectuals, to the labor movement, and to activist organizations, and to you and me. It is time to stop following and lead. 
Wasting talent is how you end up fighting wars you shouldn't fight and losing cities to a Category 3 hurricane. We have to cast our leadership net far beyond the preening, posturing politicians to bring in the very best that America has to offer. We need to draw on the creative and intellectual resources of a great school, like this one, for example, and the many other wonderful institutions of higher learning that dot the length and breadth of this land. We haven't begun to tap into the explosive, creative energy embedded in the heart of this nation. Sometimes you can actually feel the winds of history blowing, and this is one of those times. Think of all those moments in the past when ordinary people stepped into those prevailing winds and helped shape some of our proudest achievements. We can't afford to remain indifferent as history unfolds around us. If we don't shape the face of this nation in these early years of the 21st century, somebody else will. It was nearly half a century ago that Jack Kennedy said, we can do better. It's time to take him up on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You were afraid of Debbie, weren't you? <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to do questions and um, on any topic, whatever you want, the state of the sorry state of the New York Jets or uh, the fact that I have Derek Jeter on my fantasy baseball team and he's about to be put on the disabled list or um, Shall I just um, just pick? Yeah. Let's go right here. I will. Um, was everyone able to hear that? No. All right. Um, she's very concerned that the media is neither fair nor balanced in many cases and that corporate control of the media is very dangerous, that there are some pretty negative ramifications involved there. Um, the short answer to that is um, I agree. Uh, you know, if you're in the business as as embedded as deeply as I am, it's frightening. Um, it's almost as if the era of newspapers uh, is coming to an end. Papers, you know, like the New York Times and the Washington Post are struggling to find a niche on the web uh, because um, newspapers themselves are no longer self-sustaining. The corporations are taking control of um, the news that we get over the airwaves. Um, most of the time on the news cycles, it really is about celebrity and some, you know, person kidnapped or killed or whatever. And I don't have a, uh, all right, I, <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. I just have to acknowledge um, that that is the case. There are some of us who remain out there struggling as best we can, but I must say that that seems at the moment to be a losing battle. What I am hoping is that, um, I, you know, I, I, I think when I say that we're in a, a new historical period, at least as important as that immediate post-World War II era, um, I mean it. Uh, Maybe more important. But what happens in those eras, if we're lucky, is that new developments take hold that we never even dreamed of. And what I am hoping is that new and res very responsible forms of information come to the fore, whether it's going to be over the Internet or whether somebody's going to figure out a way to use the powerful medium of television uh, more intelligently or whatever. I don't think that ultimately that answer is going to come from newspapers, much to my chagrin. 
Uh, yes, sir. I have to wonder, I'd like to be optimistic as you are about this upcoming presidential election. Who said I was optimistic about this election? <laughs> I don't actually remember doing that. I have, a, I have a feeling of optimism about the country. I'm not, I don't think I was commenting specifically on this election. I was just out in Pennsylvania and I heard some scary stuff. <laughs> I'll tell you, all right. <laughs> when I was out in, um, I spoke out at Berkeley when I was out in California covering Super Tuesday when this nominating process was supposed to come to a conclusion. And I told, and, and there were a lot of young people in the audience, and, and um, uh, Barack, lost California by about 10 points, I think, when the polls had showed that he had closed to within even, and a couple of polls actually showed him a little bit ahead. Um, and Super Tuesday was a, uh, overall a disappointment for the Obama forces. Well, these kids were big Obama fans, and I was saying at the time that I thought that he had a difficult road to travel. I thought what he was doing was amazing, but I thought it would be difficult for him to get the nomination. Well... I've been getting emails since then. Oh, you said that he'd have a hard time getting the nomination. He's done nothing but win since then, blah, 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 blah. Um, now I think that it will be difficult for him to lose the nomination. But I don't think it will be easy for him to win the presidency. Now, I can't state whether <laughs> I'm optimistic or pessimistic in terms of who wins the election because the one thing that op-ed columnists are not supposed to do, we probably have more freedom than any other opinion journalist in this country, op-ed columnists at the Times, but we can't endorse candidates. Um, I assume that you're saying, since your reference to prior elections, um, that you're pessimistic because you think uh, John McCain has a good chance of winning. Well, I think John McCain has a good chance of winning. I think that... Um, I think that there is still a fair amount of racism in this country. I think that um, I know that the um, scandal over Barack Obama's former pastor has frightened a lot of people and upset a lot of people and then made a lot of other people gleeful because they are planning to use this in the general election. On the other hand, people are really hurting economically. I think it would be really ironic that for a lot of working people who have bought into policies that I think were harmful to their economic interests because of things like the Republican Southern strategy over the years might now be waking up and smelling the coffee at a time when the Democrats might be electing a black guy to be the standard bearer. I mean, they could get whiplash, like turning their heads back and forth. You know, what are we going to do now, which is some of what I saw in Pennsylvania. I have no idea whether to be optimistic or pessimistic about this election. I don't know what's going to happen in November. I think Barack Obama will be the Democratic nominee. I don't think there will be a so-called dream ticket of Barack and Hillary, although I suppose it's still possible. Um, who wins, ultimately, I don't know. On this side? Yes, sir. I... Um, I went to Pennsylvania sort of uh, driving from Scranton, which is just from Scranton down to Allentown, and there are a lot of um, uh, small towns and villages in between. Uh, it's a distressed area economically, a lot of union people. It used to be a coal mining era, then turned to manufacturing, a lot of plants closed and that sort of thing. Um, it's... Um, it's very much Hillary Clinton territory, but there are a lot of people there, Democrats, who, you know, the so-called Reagan Democrats and that sort of thing, who have been voting Republican in the past several elections. They are now starting to drift back, it appears. And um, they're legitimately 
pro-Hillary. The fact that they like Hillary Clinton is not necessarily a sign that they don't like Barack Obama. But it was very clear that many of these working class voters that I talked to, steel workers and the like, have a problem with the idea of a black guy uh, being in the White House. But at the same time, they have a problem with their own economic circumstances. They, they, they don't like uh, Bush anymore, the one time they did. And they don't like McCain. They're very hard on McCain. One thing, they think that he's just going to continue Bush's policies, in their words. Um, and two, and I was sort of surprised at this, time and again, people said to me, he's too old. One guy said to me, even the old people think that he's too old. <laughs> Um, I was surprised to hear that. So what I saw in Pennsylvania, although it was just a, a small section of the state, were voters who were almost sort of hoping Hillary could pull the nomination out of a hat so that they could run to the polls and vote for her because they want to vote Democrat. And then, but worried that she won't, and then knowing that they'll have, they'd have to make a choice at that point, would they vote for Obama, being a Democrat, someone they think is um, more favorable to their Democratic interests, or would they vote for McCain, somebody they think would be four more years at least of Bush, who many of them think is too old, and who they think is not um, somebody who would look out for their economic interests. What, what those kinds of voters would finally decide? I have no idea. Yes, ma'am. On economics, um, do you see any hope for John Edwards' position or his influence in terms of the ultimate Democratic candidate taking on a more progressive economic policy? I do. I think um, I, that's a really good question. Um, I think um, <laughs> Barack Obama got mad at me when I wrote this column. Um, <laughs> I wrote a column, there was a guy who had said to me that uh, he thought that Barack and Hillary's economic policies were, to use this term, he, 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 he mixed a metaphor. He said, I think that's awfully weak tea to hang your hat on, which I thought, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was great. <laughs> and I did agree that it was weak tea. So I put it in the lead of the column. But the whole point was that I didn't think that they had the kind of economic ideas that you're talking about. And I, in fact, definitely thought that Edwards was closer, uh, closer to the target, although I thought Edwards came up short, too. But I thought that he was out in front of both of the others. Well, when I wrote that column, soon after that, Barack came to visit the editorial board. And I, I wasn't there that day, but my assistant was there. And he says, uh, yeah, he says, Herbert, he writes, you know, weak tea, weak tea. He says, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to criticize him here. He's not here now. You know, well, gee, Barack, I think you already criticized me. <laughs> you know, but they don't think it's weak tea. Uh, what I think is going to happen is that they're going to start to see in the polls once, if it is Obama, for example, but it doesn't matter, even if it's Hillary, they're going to start to see in the polls that McCain is stronger than a, any Republican should be. Uh, given the state of affairs in this election. Edwards is going to have an influence. He's already having an influence behind the scenes. I, you know, I'm not sure what he's doing, but he's operating. I think that the Democrats are going to figure, as the economy continues to tank, that they're going to have to come up with stronger economic medicine. One, because the people are demanding it, and two, because that's going to be necessary to overcome McCain's supposedly surprising strength. So I do think that that will happen, and I think John Edwards will have some say in that. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, in the back there. I didn't hear the last part. I also think that they've been white for a lot of the racist stuff. Right. Um, good question. I'll repeat it. 
this election with uh, Barack and um, Hillary in the forefront among the Democrats um, has brought the issues of um, uh, yeah, have brought issues of race and gender to the forefront, sparked a lot of conversations. The question is, do I think that, that, that those conversations um, have been positive, have had a positive effect? Um, the short answer is yes. I, I think what's happened is remarkable. I, you know, it'll be either one of these candidates obviously have a shot at winning it all. Whether they will or not, I don't know. But the fact that the Democratic Party, in this crucial moment in American history, is about to nominate either a woman or an African American is a staggering development. And I think that that's something, whether they win it all or not, that this country ought to be proud of. Sure, there is still, I think, a tremendous amount of racism afoot in this country. We know there's a tremendous amount of sexism, misogyny in this country still. Nevertheless, if you just, you know, I'm talking about being a product of the American dream, uh, but if you go back 20 or 25 years, I don't think anyone could have imagined this state of affairs. And what it means is that the good people who were fighting those tough fights back then and even earlier than, than those days have won, that they, that that they succeeded in making this sort of thing possible. And I think all of those people um, deserve our gratitude and deserve our thanks. The other thing is, specifically to your question, do I think that these conversations will be helpful, will be constructive? I do. No matter what happens in this election, those issues are going to be on the table and Americans are going to be wrestling with them. And what I've noticed in covering this campaign is that there is a real generational divide. The older people, jeez, how did I get on that side of the divide? <laughs> the older people seem to be much more concerned uh, with these race and gender issues in terms of um, our approach to politics and government than the younger people. The younger people, um, they either like Barack or they like Hillary and let's get on with it. There's none of this torturous other stuff uh, going on. So I think that, you know, it's still tough, but we're moving in the, in the right direction and I think that we're making um, tremendous progress. Yes, sir. More talk about what? If they talk about marriage, moving towards marriage equality and like repealing John S. Hotel, I want to know whether you think that's like empty talk or don't talk. Um, I think that um, don't add, um, marriage equality, you're talking about gay marriage? Yeah. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk among Democrats about marriage equality or support for gay marriage and also ending don't ask, don't tell in the uh, military. I think that there is a chance that if you get a Democrat elected, you can get rid of don't ask, don't tell. I don't think the Democrats have uh, the courage to step up to the plate on, uh, on gay marriage. I, I, I just don't think, I, I don't see it. You know, I don't think that's going to happen, no. Um, yes, ma'am. A good assumption, <laughs> excellent assumption. <laughs> i uh, changed my mind on it. I thought up until recently, the question is how will this long fight for the nomination affect the Democrats' chances in November? <clears throat> I thought for a long time that, um, that, it would be har that it was ultimately harmful, that it would be better to select a nominee, uh, have that person, have the party rally around the person, and have the person do very much what McCain is doing now, go around raising money, looking presidential, and that sort of thing. I've changed my mind on that. And one of the reasons I've changed my mind is that I've been talking to the voters. And the voters are not upset by what's going on. Not only are they not upset, 
they're energized. I mean, so every state that, that you go, that these candidates go into and battle it out, you got all these new people registering to vote. You've got, in many cases, Republicans registering as Democrats, and not just to cause um, uh, mischief, you know, and try and, you know, foul things up. There's a lot of people coming over because they're tired of what's been going on uh, over the past few years. So, and then all kinds of money uh, is being raised. I think that ultimately this helps the Democrats. What, is, what really hurts the Democrats is if the fight between the two candidates gets very bitter, as it has at times. So when you have a Hillary Clinton or a Bill Clinton, for example, saying that, you know, well, Hillary's qualified to be commander-in-chief and John McCain's sure qualified to be commander-in-chief, you know, but maybe the jury's still out on Barack. Or when you have Bill Clinton saying, wouldn't it be great to have two candidates who love their country, meaning Hillary and John McCain, those kinds of things can be very harmful for the Democratic Party. If you can avoid those kinds of debilitating encounters, I think ultimately the long fight is very helpful um, to the Democrats. Mm, yes, sir, and then I'll go to you. Yeah, I think we can um, raise our standard of living. I think we need to work harder and be more creative. I think we obviously need to find some alternatives to our uh, overwhelming dependence on uh, um, foreign oil in particular and, um, you know, oil um, in general. Um, but I think those things are doable. We, the, you know, countries who survive for another 100 or 200 years, not just survive but thrive, are going to have to develop these alternatives anyway. I think that's going to happen. I don't see any reason why the United States shouldn't be in the forefront. We're smart enough. Uh, yeah, I said you'd be next. You had, in addressing all these problems facing our country, one of the things you had said was, or talked about, was this need for personal responsibility and uh, personal involvement, whether it's in civic organizations or in politics. But how do we promote a national value of civic engagement and individual responsibility? Um, it would be great if some of our leaders press that more than they are now. Um, the other way is to have it come from the bottom up. The other way is for, for you guys to go out there and do it, for you just to say, you know, this is something that we need to talk about. I don't care what it is. It could be a presidential campaign. You could be a volunteer in a campaign. You could be working on a local school board. Um, it could be anything. It could be participating in literacy programs, just sort of get started. At some point you reach a critical mass, you know. When um, uh, in, the, in the women's movement, when, um, you know, some women in some local area just got fed up and said, I'm tired of it, you know, I'm not going to take it anymore. Whoever those individuals were didn't know that a mass movement was going to get sparked and that, the, you know, the United States would be transformed, but that's what happened. In, 19, in talking about your question about um, um, what we might do about the energy situation when Jack Kennedy said in 1961 or 62 that we're going to go to the moon and bring a man safely back to Earth, uh, by the end of the decade, nobody knew how to go to the moon. He just said, we're going to do it. Well, we don't know what we're going to do as alternatives to oil, but we better find out. And I think it's possible for us to find out. And I think it's possible for us to become more deeply engaged in the civic affairs of this country. I, I don't think it's just possible. I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, just a couple more questions. Yes, sir? What do you think the biggest problem facing our country will be in 10 or 15 years? Uh, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got... Well, we got some heavy stuff right now. <laughs> I don't know, 10 or 15 years from now. Yes, sir? Uh, one, one, of the, one of the events that we're going to see in a great deal of play, which I thought was very important, was this resignation of Admiral Fallon. Um, that's true. Admiral, oh, I'm sorry.
<laughs> if I was a Republican, I'd take it off the table. <laughs> at this. The question is, um, what do I think the chances are that the Republicans in desperation might come up with an October surprise in this election to wit an attack on Iran? Um, I can't make a crack about it, a joke about it, because it's too serious. Uh, but um, if it wasn't so serious, I would, I would tell the Republicans to do something silly like that. I would say, go for it. Uh, I think you do that at your absolute peril. I think the country would freak out if the United States attacked um, Iran just before the presidential election, and I think it would seal the Republicans' doom. That's, that's my personal opinion. You seem skeptical. Do you, you think, do you think that that might work? Wow. Everybody would suddenly get behind the flag and worry about the security? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be the case this time. I, I, I think things have become fairly transparent now. People are tired of the war in Iraq. I don't think the country is up for a new conflict. Um, I, hope, I hope you guys are wrong on both counts. One, I hope it... <laughs> doesn't happen, and if it does happen, I sure hope it doesn't work. Yes, sir? Sir, is there any chance that you'd be willing to take a leave of absence from the New York Times to become a speechwriter for Iran? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not Well, I'll tell you the main reason why there's no chance of that's hap that happening. <laughs> Barack <laughs> would be. <laughs> uh, he, has, he would have no interest in that, but he's a great writer um, himself, and then the other answer, the no, would come from me as well. So since he's not interested, and since I'm not interested, the likelihood of that happening is getting to be very low. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right now there's a huge achievement gap between those who go to school in high-income neighborhoods and those that go to school in low-income neighborhoods. Any thoughts on how to fix our broken public education system so that students can get um, uh, I have to keep the... the oh, uh, the, she's talking about the achievement uh, gaps uh, between... Uh, high-income neighborhoods and low-income neighborhoods between um, whites and Asians on the one hand and blacks and Latinos on the other and any thoughts on how to fix that. I don't have time to go into all the different reasons, um, all the different things I think we might be trying, but one of the things we should pay very close attention to is I've been, I've covered some of the KIPP schools over the years which have had a um, uh, very good track record uh, helping troubled kids really achieve at astonishing rates. And then I was just talking to some people who were telling me about green dot schools in Los Angeles, which I had never heard of, but which are similar, I think, uh, to the KIPP schools. And what I think we ought to be doing is going to those schools that have demonstrated success and find out what the heck it is they're doing right. And I don't know why it's been taking so long for us to try and replicate that, but we need to do it. Yes, ma'am. Well, the interest groups are going to be there. I mean, the interest groups vary. You know, uh, you have Republicans who say that labor is an interest group. Um, you know, you have the Democrats who say the oil interests are an interest group. Or, you know, um, the interest groups are always going to be there. Um, you know, we have free speech in this country, and we have an open political system. The question is, how do you correct the imbalance of influence that they that they have? And um, there's only two ways. One, it can come from the leaders themselves. It can come from the people in the White House and in the Congress on the national level. And if that doesn't work, then it has to come from the people. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm making a call for civic engagement. I want to see more of it. That becomes an interest group. When Americans stand up for their own rights and make their own demands, then the people become an interest group. I think we need more of it. Two more questions. Uh, yes, sir.
Uh, I, 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 it, would, it would be two things. One, I would really pin them down and try and... Oh, I'm sorry. If I was moderating a presidential debate in the fall, what would be the two or three uh, principal questions that I would ask? There would be two areas that I would want to focus on. One, I would really like to pin them down on Iraq and ask why... Um, uh, it, if, it would, if it was a debate, I would ask uh, McCain, you know, uh, what he possibly sees in concrete terms as an upside for this country in continuing to, f to pursue this war for another several years. And for the Democrat, I would say, why have you not been more courageous in... Um, in showing the public the damage that this war is doing to the interests of the United States and to Americans, and then um, uh, putting forth your own program for getting U.S. troops out of there in a reasonably short period of time in total. Th those would be the two areas. That, that would be the one area that I would ask. The other area I would talk about would be jobs, because I think the only salvation economically for this country right now is a massive increase in jobs, however it's done. We should be trying to find out from the smartest people in the country how to get many millions of additional Americans employed because Americans have maxed out their credit card, they've gone through the stock market bubble, they've gone through the housing bubble, they've taken the equity out of their homes. There's not many more ways for Americans, this is a consumer society, to get their hands on money to spend in the marketplace um, other than through employment. We need to put more Americans back to work. I think I'm going to wrap it up. You guys have been great. I really appreciate it. Thank you.